everybody, uh, we will start uh, with introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be introducing uh, our today's speaker because this particular presentation is co-sponsored by uh, Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. And the topic, as you can see, is uh, very interesting. Uh, basically, when to hold it, one, uh, when to fold it, and when to play it right. Um, and it will be about intellectual property, about licensing, patent protection, uh, options for open source licensing, and many other interesting things. Uh, and I will just give you an example. This morning I was co-host for one foreign delegation that visited the Berkeley Virus Research Center and I heard about open source uh, approach in which uh, uh, and they're designing chips, those chips, not fleet, but the other ones. <laughs> uh, so they have open source agreements with Silicon Valley in which they basically provide Silicon Valley companies that are partners with six months advance notice. So they have access to whatever they design six months prior to release to the public. So you will probably give some additional examples. Uh, so we will have two speakers today. Um, Leila, is it right? Um, last name? Sorry, yes. Oh, I'm sorry about it. Um, is Senior Licensing Officer, Office of Technology Licensing uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, she develops uh, intellectual property strategy and oversees licensing for many, many areas, including engineering. Not to mention other life sciences, chemistry, and so on and so on. Additionally, she handles trade night mark and corporate matters, open source compliance, and government grant and contract intellectual property matters. Leila is a trained scientist and worked for several years in research before practicing law. So we have an example of uh, a scientist. She got a PhD in biophysics from UC San Francisco. and. She did some cancer research in several uh, universities and places, and then um, decided to switch to uh, law and got JD from Concord Law School. Uh, she is also a member of California State Bar and is registered to practice before US Patent and Trademark Office. Then we have uh, Kate Lewis. She is Associate Director, Industry Alliance Office at UC Berkeley. Uh, she has been with UC Berkeley for more than 13 years, previously at Berkeley Seismological Laboratory and uh, Sponsor Project Office. Um, and she received her bachelor and master degrees in uh, sociology and is an active participant in the industry contact officers net network and the uh, uh, society for research administration. I didn't read all of your great accomplishments, but I think this is enough. Uh, please take over. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, so we are from the Intellectual Property and Industry Research Alliance office. That's an umbrella office that incorporates two offices, the Industry Alliance's office, and that's where I'm representing today. We handle industry-sponsored research. So anytime a company wants to sponsor research at Berkeley, they'll go through our office. We also help to develop relationships between our faculty and researchers and our company technical people. Um, and we handle all in licensing, so any materials, data, software that's coming into the university for our faculty and researchers to use in their work um, will we'll help to bring that in. Um, we also manage contract-based industry affiliate programs. Um, those are like clubs uh, and companies will all sign the same agreement. We'll come up with a custom contract to reflect what we want to happen, so if there's software being developed or, or patents um, anticipated. And then all members get the same access to research results, early access to publications, um, often sit on an industry advisory board so they get to help um, choose which projects get funded for that year that the faculty put forward. Um, and then we also help with non-disclosure agreements. 
So if you're ever out um, and a company's asking you to sign something because you're talking about a future potential project or a proposal, we can help with that as well so that the university is taking responsibility for it. And we are the sister office when there are inventions or software disclosures uh, or questions about copyrights, the types of open source licenses that you're interested in, we handle them in our office. And uh, we also provide patent applications and when there are software disclosures, we provide uh, protection for those. And when there's interest, when there's commercial interest for the patent applications or the software pieces, we are the ones who negotiate the companies and licenses, including our own startups, of course. So our offices are very complementary. We work together on a lot of things. Um, when industry sponsoring research, it's often uh, more applied research further along in technology development. And so companies are often interested in, in really wondering what's gonna happen next. So if there's an invention, how much time do I have? How is that gonna impact us? What, what can we do with that? Um, and so we work together a lot at the negotiation of the initial contract stage. And, um, and then the licensing office will take the outline that we've put together, the roadmap, in the contract and hopefully be able to use that of licensing to make it easier to make it faster. Um, and so we very much work together. Um, so this is our, our office, uh, entirely our mission. Um, so we want to maintain multifaceted relationships with companies, with industry, um, where they sponsor research, they can engage through giving a gift to the university, potentially engage through sponsoring a postdoc. Um, and we are really trying to increase You know, federal, we've been is here to help facilitate making the move into industry sponsored research um, and to increase funding. We are hoping to enhance the campus enterprise um, through intellectual property management. Like we said, we try to develop a, a really nice roadmap in our research agreements so that we can manage IP easier on the back end uh, or the front end. And then thinking about facilitating relationships with industry, with our partners, with the technical folks, with the legal folks, um, really to develop a long-term relationship so that they not only sponsor one project, but hopefully are interested in, in continuing the cycle where they sponsor a project now, potentially license something, and then come back. Um, a lot of our companies, I think like 60 or 70 percent, come back and sponsor multiple projects, which is really good for us. Um, support regional economic development, as uh, so that's how we get involved with our startups, with our startup ecosystem. And we're affiliated with Skydeck um, and some of the other accelerators on campus. And then to do all of that stuff without compromising our goals as a public research institution. So we, so as we know, companies and universities sometimes seem like they're completely opposite. Um, companies often want to keep everything confidential. They want to own everything, have little restriction in universities when we get everything out to the open. So part of what we're trying to do is work with industry to, to make sure we are not compromising our research mission while coming up with something that works for both parties. So we'll talk a little bit about industry-sponsored research, um, talk a little bit about IP, what IP is, how we license, what the patent process looks like, and then we want to open it up to questions. And actually you can ask questions throughout if you have questions, um, you can give some examples. Yeah. Um, so we are seeing an increase in industry-sponsored research. Um, we're seeing that a lot of companies are shutting down their R&D side or they're scaling it back. They may uh, be moving in different directions. Um, so part of the reason why they want to partner with universities is that we have all these state-of-the-art labs. We have state-of-the-art faculty and staff, um, graduate students, postdocs, and it's a lot cheaper to do business here. So something that might cost a million dollars at a company, we might be able to do for $200,000 here because the, the cost of labor is lower. We already have all the equipment, we already have the expertise. So that's one of the reasons. Um, another reason is companies are often doing really high risk research um, here at, at a university because it's cheaper and if there's failure, if it doesn't work, then it's not gonna cost them millions of dollars in that cycle. Um, and then, if you know, what we've talked about also is recruitment, graduate student recruitment, postdoc recruitment, all of those things benefit companies working with Berkeley. Um, so the process is a little bit different from working with federal government. We still go through the 
same systems that we use at Berkeley, uh, but oftentimes the project starts with a conversation. It might be a company representative has listened to a talk that you've given or, or seen an article that you've published, and they'll contact you. They might contact us and ask for an introduction. Um, and so a lot of times the relationship develops kind of organically, and, and then my office can help facilitate discussions, can talk about how we structure agreements before we even get to a proposal. So we're, we're here to help you have those conversations, um, help to facilitate those conversations. And then once we have a proposal, we'll negotiate a contract. Um, we'll work with you to make sure that we have the terms that work for you. Uh, for example, if the anticipated outcome is software and you want to release that software open source, um, a lot of our faculty do, then we wouldn't agree in a contract to giving an exclusive license to a company because then we wouldn't be able to open source it. So we'll talk to you to make sure that we're all on the same page um, and then hopefully get it done quickly so that you can start your research project. Um, oftentimes reports are one of the outcomes, but there are also potentially expectations of inventions and in software algorithms. Um, so when talking with industry, the goal is to really get them excited about what you're doing. Uh, so you can show them what you've done, but we, we do caution against showing things that are unpublished unless we have an NDA in place. Um, we don't want a company to come in and scoop what you're doing, or we have unfortunately had uh, experience with a researcher faculty talking to a company, and then that company took that project somewhere else and started shopping it around other universities. So we want to make sure that we're protecting your research, your ideas, um, so we're here to help with that process as well. And we're always here to answer questions uh, and to help. Um, so this is where we get to confidentiality agreements, NDAs, CDAs. Um, oftentimes before you're starting to actually get to the nitty gritty of looking at a proposed research project, the company will ask you to sign an NDA. Uh, our recommendation is to send those to our office so that we can make sure that they're acceptable terms and conditions. We have seen NDAs that incorporate backgrounds, intellectual property, that incorporate intellectual property that you may be creating in the future. And so part of what we're trying to do is just making sure that it's limited to just the conversation that you're having or the development of a proposal, and then it doesn't incorporate any of this other stuff. Um, so we're here to help with that process as well. Um, if it's something that you're doing as a consulting, if there's something on the side, maybe you're going to potentially intern at a company, um, we, we'd also just advise you to look at that NDA really carefully and we can help to advise um, on those as well. Um, export control I'm sure everyone's very familiar with. Um, so Berkeley operates under the fundamental research exemption. Uh, we do seek to maintain an open academic atmosphere. Uh, however, we do know that, especially with nuclear engineering, there could be times that we need to put in place technology management plans. For example, if we're getting software um, from a company or a national lab that is subject to export control regulations, we have wonderful people that will help out with that and we can help to move that along and facilitate those conversations as well. So the, the export control <laughs> business for us obviously is a rather sensitive topic. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you have people on staff, we can have them review case by case, yeah. um, who we talk to and what we share uh, with them at any given time. So we have, um, we have somebody in the Research Administration and Compliance Office, Alicia Hellman, is now tasked with export control, so she's our person for campus, and she works closely with Patrick Schlesinger, who you may have worked with before, um, to help review the cases and helps with put together technology management plans. And, and how would you go about it? Oftentimes people don't know when they may be violating some export control, right? Yeah, because and, there's so many rules and regulations around it. And as an individual, you have no way of knowing what you should bring to your office and what you can't bring to your office. And unfortunately, you as the researcher will be personally responsible if you break the rules. So that's a little scary, but we are here to help. So. Um, something that we advise is if you are getting any external technical data, equipment, software, any of those things, that you go through our office to bring those things in. And if we identify something that could be export controlled, we'll go back to the company and say, what are you, what are you transferring? What's the ECCN number? 
we'll kind of try to get some background information and then we'll hand it off to the export control folks to put together a management plan. And that way, you know, hopefully we'd be mitigating some risk of accidentally disclosing something or accidentally, you know, using the software in a way that we're not supposed to, something like that. Do you track uh, shipments which go out of campus? That's an excellent question. So, uh, Mark, the, the person in the College of Engineering who handles the shipments, did attend the export control all day course that you see OKFIT on last year. I'm not sure what's happened since then. Um, but uh, because a lot of faculty ship stuff out directly and don't go through a central place, that is a huge risk. Yeah. So there's no way of mitigating that through campus in some form or fashion. I mean, we could require faculty to ship only through the bottlenecks, which I don't think is going to happen. I don't um, actually think it's like campus. There's no resource. Well, I mean, I mean, we could set something up. if we really wanted to yeah. to mitigate the risk entirely. We could set something up and require faculty to do that. I don't think that would fly. Um, I know that the College of Engineering has a shipping person that I think handles a lot of the external shipments. Yeah, it's mostly the receiving end, not so much the going out. Yeah. And then on the receiving side, we also don't have a central place where some, anybody's going through and making sure what we're getting is. So, there's. Yeah, this is a difficult thing. I mean, yeah. I run into this occasionally, or I did run into this occasionally, uh, shipping things to a foreign country. It, it can be as simple as a piece of steel, mm -hmm. uh, if you, which may be protected and you didn't know about. Um, just that particular alloy has to be uh, uh, protected. You were not able to ship that out. Fortunately, we caught it, but I'm sure there's probably dozens of times on campus where people don't catch it. So campus or UC system wide has a subscription to a program called Visual Compliance, where you can type in, you can do export control checks, you can type in and really drill down. Um, so that is a, that is a resource. I don't know if it's open to everyone or if you have to have a license to it, but it might be useful to have a license somewhere in. College of Engineering or several for people to be able to just run quick checks. Um, Alicia, the export control person, has access. We have access in my office because it's also used to, to run reports on excluded parties and other potential compliance issues. So if there is something that, that seems questionable, you can come to us and we can, and we can try to help. Okay, so this. What we talked about in the beginning is our ideal um, cycle of innovation where a company sponsors research. There's an invention disclosure. We end up being able to license that uh, invention to the company. Uh, and then they want to sponsor additional research. So this, this is our success story. When we are negotiating, oftentimes our negotiations with companies can be tricky um, for a number of reasons. But uh, what we tell them and what's true is that this is a success case for us. We really want that company to be our licensee. We really want that company to be able to take that technology that we generate here and get it out for public benefit. Um, and so that, you know, helps to move along with the licensing talks sometimes. I'm sorry. Yeah. How do you persuade the interaction between the university and the industry? Many years ago, Stanford was way ahead of us. Uh, um, what's interesting, so that's, that's interesting, so we work very closely with Stanford's industry contracts office. They're similar to what we do, but they don't, they only do contracts. So I think Stanford, UCSF is the same, has dedicated people who go out and do business development. Um, our office and we're hoping to expand this. But part of my job is to go out and do business development as well. So I will be negotiating a contract with the company, but I might be in an all-day meeting with them. For example, this Friday we have an all-day meeting with Honda where we're talking about how to structure uh, a partnership, a larger institutional level partnership where they can give gifts, they can give, they can sponsor research, they can license, and really just figure out how to structure these. So we are behind Stanford, but we're catching up. We're trying to. Um, we have several negotiations. So what, what that are, steps are we taking yeah. so that we can catch up? Um, asking for more funding. Um, 
I'm joking, but um, so part of what we're doing is trying to do more of these meetings, um, trying to be more, for lack of a better word, proactive instead of reactive. So oftentimes companies are coming to us saying we want to work with Berkeley, how can we engage? Um, and so we're trying to go out and do more marketing and business development. We have a position open right now for a senior level marketing person to help market research capabilities and to help market licensable technologies, available technologies. Um, and we're really hoping that that position is going to help bring in more people and more companies. And if it does, I think that that function can be expanded. Um, if we can show value, if we can show that the efforts, uh, that the marketing efforts are actually bringing companies to the door that we haven't worked with. One of the fundamental differences also that we have from Stanford is Stanford is a hospital university. So between sister universities at UC, for example, UCLA and UCSF have a lot more money and get a lot more interest, especially in the areas that end up with drugs that bring in enormous quantities of money. So of the UC sister campuses, Berkeley is not a campus that has naturally that we don't have the hospitals. But one of the other things that we're doing is now we're working a lot with UCSF. So together we are bringing in, you know, where we are um, getting research interests and also yeah, but, but, uh, uh, in terms of engineering and science is also except the answer in the UCSF part in biology. But we are way behind in terms of engineering also with that uh, as compared to sound. Maybe we should look at the same programs to see which, which other sister universities as far as we have, you know, so we can work together for that. That would be one. But it's okay. not their yeah. job. But it's it's our job. job. It's your job. It's my job. It's Peter's job. Uh, this morning I was in Berkeley Valley Research Center. It's a group of five or six ECS faculty that had products that are of interest to Silicon Valley. So in order to become a member of their group, Silicon Valley company pays 100,000 per year just to have access six months before the public. And they have 20 of those, if not 30 of those companies. So imagine how much money the group has. And it's only five faculty. Fa I hope you're not saying that you're behind the Stanford in terms of uh, <laughs> that was an answer. No, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's you, yeah. if you have a product that industry would like to have, then it'll come to you. But we are at the same level in terms of science and engineering. So MIT has a program like that, where it's an industry program where companies can join for a certain amount of money, and they get early access. They get early access to publications. We've talked about this for years. I know the College of Engineering has an industry membership program as well. Part of the difficulty with Berkeley is that we are huge. Um, we don't want to have competition with our office trying to do this campus-wide, trying to go after the same people that College of Engineering has as their members. So we've been, we've been talking, talking about trying to figure out how to do this so that we have, so we can do this better. Because I think you're absolutely right. Um, so we, we have been talking about it. I mean, if you have ideas, you let us know too. We're all ears. Yeah. These, yeah. these partnership programs are great, right? But it's, it's sort of you have to pay into this pot. Typically, it's 50K a year or something like that to be a member, depending what the topic is. NSF supports it, right? There's many programs like that. Mm -hmm. um, but they typically only work for larger companies. They don't work for smaller companies, startup type, because the, the entry level is too steep. And therefore, smaller. You know, maybe early stage developments are not captured that way. Yeah. Um, so particularly engaging with startup companies can be a little bit more tricky. They don't have the resources in most instances um, to become a member of 50 or 100K a year. Right? That's a full staff person for them. Uh, and so, so what is it that you, I guess, what, what the, the campus can do in order to facilitate these type of interactions and capture them rather than the big, and, uh, houses and we do have some industry affiliate programs that are contract based that have tiered systems, including a startup level. So that is up to the faculty if they want to do that. Um, our office isn't going to force having a lower level membership class, but we do have some that, that have followed that model. 
Um, so that is always an option, adding, adding a startup model, adding, sometimes we have ones that have a nonprofit as well, depending on the, the field of study. Um, going back to UCSF, they have uh, a dedicated office of alliance management people, um, and those, and they have partnerships with Pfizer, with, with big companies, um, where one of those staff person might spend 50 of their, 50% of their time working on the relationship with Pfizer to make sure that they get what they need, that they feel like they know what's going on on campus. It could be technology spotting, it could be um, new research areas, all of that. That is a model that we could look at as well, but that again is, it's not just $100,000 to be able to fund a program like that. And um, that is something that we're looking at. How do we set up these institutional relationships where we can more easily facilitate not only sponsored research and not only licensing, but gifts coming in, potentially fellowships for postdocs, um, all the different ways that we can engage with, with industry and industry can engage with us. Uh, to my knowledge, the uh, optimal technology offices are Uh, technology offices are private institutions. Is there something fundamentally different that prevents, uh, that gives them an advantage for a private institution over public institutions? I can say one and then I can hand it over. Um, one that we know that our friends at Stanford can pay for patent costs. They have a lot of money, um, and so they can patent everything if they want to, and they're able to, to front load those costs. And then if they have a licensee, they can get reimbursed. Berkeley does not have money to do that. So that's, a, that's one major difference. We just don't have the same type of resources. And secondly, I guess we, um, we have not been as aggressive in a lot of areas for patenting, actually, or our, maybe our faculty and staff students have not been as aggressive. You know, Berkeley is the one that instituted the BSD open source program, right? So it's, um, we, we, the one time that Berkeley paid it some money actually to go, go into litigation was to allow open source BSD. So, because the other company wanted to take it away and wanted to make it, you know, um, for profit. So, because of that, you know, we, we really, really and truly are an open environment for, for education. So, as time is going by, and I'm seeing it with my own eyes, now we are becoming, our staff students are becoming more interested, especially in these areas, not just in the pharmaceuticals. I am, I am seeing in the software industry, the engineering, the physical sciences, that people are getting more interested in monetizing and commercializing their technologies. I'm all ears and happy to help. Would we, would we allow them to just present? No, uh, let's ask. Let's do this for fun, actually. We're thinking this line. We really look at the one example that is really nice of this uh, CRISPR technology. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right? It is the knowledge that we have and that you have, and we are so grateful to have, actually, I do see, right? It includes inventions, it includes software copyrights, it includes uh, patents that protect inventions, it includes trademarks, and um, two varieties that we don't work with or we don't try to protect here at all, I do see. One of them is know-how, like how something gets done, and the other one is trade secrets. We don't keep trade secrets because we are an open university. Um, and so we don't give trade secrets, we don't keep them, we don't license them, we also don't do that with know-how. However, we are more than happy to deal with uh, copyrights, patents, and trademarks. Our office doesn't handle trademarks. We have the BCTP group who does that for uh, UC specific trademarks. So what are trademarks? So, so trademarks basically protect the brand, just to make sure that there's no confusion between a brand and a counterpart brand. Uh, for example, Berkeley tries to keep the name Berkeley, UC Berkeley, keeps the name UC Berkeley very, very well protected. Um, the whole idea being to not create confusion in the marketplace. Um, Copyrights uh, protect tangible <coughs> um, notions of um, what is created in the mind. So for example, software is copyrightable, publications are copyrightable, music is copyrightable, dances, if you can put them in tangible forms, they're all copyrighted. And so accurately, we can handle copyrights for software and also for publications. And as, I, as you all know, um, Berkeley and yourselves might be very interested to open source everything. Open source is not free. Every open source piece of software comes with a license. Um, and that license dictates how that open source will work, right? So some open source pieces of software are truly open source, basically like the PSD open source software. It says, go ahead and do whatever you want with this piece of software. Just don't come back to try to sue me and don't use my name in vain. But there are others, for example, like the GPL software or the Afro GPL software uh, licenses that are what are known as viral. So if you statically link to them or if you change the base code that has that GPL license, your entire software base becomes virally infected, meaning that you have to then release your entire software base as GPL. So if you are planning to use it, or if you're planning, and, and I know everybody calls into GPL licensed software. So, but at some point, if you have developed a piece of software and you're interested to either license it or to open source release it, please contact me or contact our office. I would be more than happy to help you to stick the correct license to it. So, especially if you're commercially going to be interested in it as well, and you want to open source it, we can handle the dual licenses as well. I, we already went into this one. So, um, trade secrets are information that is known, not known to the public, but is kept very, very well within a company. So, I have, I have a couple of them out there, right? So, the recipe for Coke or the recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, those are very well known trade secrets, right? Um, nobody knows the actual recipe. And the good thing about it is that nobody is supposed to know about it. The bad thing about it is if somebody figures it out or somebody creates something exactly like it, then you know that's not a very good thing. And I, I, we already talked about know-how also. That's knowledge that is known to you, but not necessarily out in the public domain, at least yet. So patents um, are one way of protecting inventions. And inventions, based on what is defined in the US Patent and Trademark Office is anything created by man that is either novel, so nobody has ever done it before, non-obvious, meaning that basically your invention has a couple of pieces, but nobody has put them together like you have put them together before, and it's useful. So for example, the first uh, light bulb that came along, right, it is created that first light bulb, the pieces were not to the public, but he had, Nobody had put them together that way before. Of course, the patent office rejected it, but then you know it went through and finally got patented. Uh, but it also has to be useful. So, like in biosciences, if you create a mouse just to feed it to a lion, that's not useful. 
But if you create a mouse to, if you design and create a mouse to do um, uh, cancer research with it, for example, that's useful. Then you can patent that. Um, patents, with the size, if it's useful or not. Sorry? With the size, if it's useful or not. Actually, the patent and trademark office, the examiners do. And the examiners actually uh, decide the novelty. So it's, I always call it a dance, right? We file a patent application for an invention. And I always say that when we file applications, I will ask for the entire street, but I'm happy with my own, right? And because it becomes a dance with the patent office back and forth in what it is actually that I should be allowed to get uh, versus what they think I should be allowed to get. And at the end, we compromise and we reach some conclusion on your invention. That's the deed to the house. That's your deed. That, that's, that's how exactly I call it. So, um, they decide patentability, they decide novelty, they decide on, on obviousness, and it's my job to argue. I love arguing science, so I argue that you're full of it. No, 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 this is patentable and for this reason, this reason, and this. No, it's not obvious, actually, uh, because if you put all of those together, you don't get to the intended result. And it is useful because, look, right? So, that's how. Ah, so, so a patent actually gives a right to a person to exclude others from making, using, or selling what they have created. But the funny part about a patent is that it does not necessarily allow you to practice what you invented yourself. So let's say that you, somebody invented a car, right? And now you have invented a door knob that is specific to that car. So while you, have, you can use your doorknob. If that doorknob is totally useless without the car, you need a license from the inventor of the car to be able to actually use the doorknob with the car. So the best types of inventions are those that are standalone and to practice them, you really don't need or your licensee will not really need another license from another entity to be able to, to do it. You ask questions. I don't want to more than the next five. So a patent from the first time that it is filed internationally or nationally within the U.S. expires 20 years from that intention, if from that um, original filing. They have 20 years to stop others, and after that, it becomes dedicated to the public. Oh, there you go. So it is. Uh, but so if you don't pay your fees, then it expires. Right? Of course. <laughs> so, and the fees higher with that year. Assuming, exactly. So, so as well, if that depends on which part of the world you're in, right? So, in yeah. Europe, you have to pay every single year to first actually be able to um, to prosecute the patent, and then every single year to be able to maintain it. In the U.S., it's different. You pay to patent it, and then you have three payments um, to keep it maintained in the in the third year, seventh year, and the twelfth year after. And depending on which type of entity you are, so if you're a university, if you're just an individual, the, the fees are low. But if you're a big company, the fees are nice and low. So one of the things that's really, really, really important to us uh, for patenting inventions is to not publish or print what you have before you are filing an invention disclosure with us or before you file a patent application. There is a, it used to be that in the US we had this, this rule of first to invent. So if you're the first to invent and then you can show with diligence that you were working on your invention to actually make it, um, you still could have your invention and you'd be able to patent it. Then the law changed in 2013, 2014-ish, and it became first to file, just like the rest of the world. So now we are in a first to file kind of a world. If you publish before you provide us with an invention disclosure, time starts to tick. The first thing that happens is you lose, we lose all rights around the world, but we still have one year in the US if somebody else does not um, invent the exact same thing or file on the exact same. So we have to be really, really careful. If you have an invention or you believe you might have an invention, please contact us, contact me. Um, we'll help you through the disclosure and then we will, um, it's, it's really easy for me. It takes me, it takes us a couple of days to actually file what is known as a placeholder provisional application. 
we'll file a provisional, go ahead and do your publication, and then we deal with it later. Um, if within a year we still don't have a commercial interest in the invention, at, even after it has published, then we have some talking to do. Uh, we may not want to let it go. Yeah. How do you deal with uh, technology developed both? Uh, well, yeah, how do you deal with uh, IP developed between UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab? So Berkeley Lab actually is um, run by UC. Mm -hmm. Um, every invention that is done at Berkeley Lab ultimately is, gets assigned to the regents. We are all under the regental um, umbrella, gets assigned to the regents. If there was an invention that was done, for example, with a professor or a student who sits here, but also sits in Berkeley Lab, let's say, right, we deal with how the funding came along. If the funding came, if all of the funding was done at UC, the work was done at UC, it will be UCs. But if the work was done half and half, my buddy and I at LBNL we will talk with each other, no problem. We will file. One of us decides to file, we do we go through a, an interinstitutional agreement. Either the one of us will do the filing and then we decide what to do when as we want. We have we have a very good relationship with the lab. I do at least. So yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else? Okay, so so this is this is what we just talked about. When um, you believe you have an invention, you have a novel idea, you are really interested for you, you seek to protect it. Um, go please through the invention disclosure system. Uh, the, the site is really easy to use, whether it's software, whether it's an invention. If you are not sure how to, how to do it, just contact us, contact any one of us. There's six of me sitting in the office. Um, uh, we are all happy to help. Um, when we receive disclosures, the, the most important part that we do look at, you know, for, we, we do look at every disclosure, right? It is important for us to know whether the, this, the invention actually works. Is it safe, right? And whether there is any commercial interest in the technology, um, either now or later. The reason for that is if you file patent applications and there is no commercial interest, patent applications tend to be expensive. In your area, for example, for engineering, from filing to issuance in the US, we're talking about $50,000. Um, you see, you know, we, we cannot front all of that money all the time. If a technology is promising and we are likely to have licenses, we'll definitely go through with the patent application process and then the licensee will help us to pay for the applications. But if there is no potential licensee, a patent application becomes an extraordinarily expensive publication. So um, we have to review basically every disclosure that comes along to know whether we want to actually file a patent application or not to, to bring it to fruition as a patent dispenser. Um, at the end of the day, even if we don't file a patent application, it doesn't mean that the invention was, was not very good. We can always publish it, right? And we do always publish it as a university because then it also creates a poison pill for anybody else who might want to think about filing a patent on it because then you receive precedent to anybody else who might want to file an invention. Okay, <laughs> so when we receive an invention disclosure, um, like I said, a couple of things. Um, a few things make us to file them uh, on them really quickly. Usually, it is the person telling me I'm publishing this within the next week. You know, so <laughs> but, ah, I'll, I'll just file one, right? Otherwise, um, we do check for commercial feasibility before we file. Also, sometimes there is a sponsor sitting out there and asking us to file. We file because the sponsor is interested to pay for the patent application filing and prosecution. Um, usually the first step that we take is what is known as a provisional application. They are inexpensive patent applications. They're placeholders with the patent office. It just tells the patent office, look, we are kicking the tires on this one. If you think we have something, we're going to evaluate it for one year. Then we come back to you to see what we, what we want to do. Um, towards the end of that year, one of us will be approach, approaching you guys to see how the technology is doing, how the work is coming along, if there's still interest, if there is commercial interest. And if there is, then we file usually either a US or an international application or both. 
And then the dance starts, like I said, with the international patent offices and or with the US patent office. Um, if we have filed internationally, we have another 18 months to wait for commercial, to, to see commercial interest. Because after the 18 months, then we absolutely have to decide which jurisdictions, countries we want to go into. And at that, now by then we have had 30 months to see whether there was commercial interest or not. If at the end of those 30 months, there really wasn't commercial interest, we really are really not likely to go on with it anymore. Um, and then um, if there is commercial interest, we will go based on uh, what the potential, where the potential licensee would like to go. Usually from filing to issuance in the US, in your technology is about five years. Ah, okay, so we um, then let's say that we have do have a patent application or there is licensing interest. What types of um, agreements do we enter into? Um, the answer is depends on who is approaching us, right? So a lot of times when our own uh, students, postdocs, professors want to start startups, we would love to start with them because they're small entities, they're small companies, you know, they're just startups, right? We enter into what are known as letter agreements. They're really, really inexpensive one page documents that say, we promise to give you this technology for this one year, six months, whatever. You have the chance to work on this um, in your company. And then we will see where we want. Then you tell us, you come back and tell us whether you have further interest or not. Within that year, um, we will be handling still the prosecution matters. And um, letter agreements are really good for, especially for startups, because when startups go after SBIR funding, STTR uh, funding, um, the officers on the other side are really interested to know whether you have the IP. So somehow assured or not, right? Um, held or not. And we write letter agreement. <clears throat> we like letters to the NIH or you know any the entity that's giving the SBIR or STTR funding to say, oh yeah, we're very interested in these people. We're about to license them this technology. We support them, and <clears throat> more likely than not, they get the, the money. Um, the other type of agreements are option agreements, which is usually the next stage agreements. For a little bit more money, we give you the option to negotiate a license agreement. The option agreements <coughs> we'd like to keep for the bigger companies, because with, a, uh, with our own startups, we can do the letter agreement and just go on until we just en we enter into a license agreement. And the last agreement that we go into are license agreements, which, which can be of a variety, right? They can be non-exclusive, they can be exclusive. If it's a startup, we can take equity in lieu of some of the um, some of the upfront money that we get from them. Also, this way we have skin in the game, and the company has skin in the game, and it looks good for VCs. And we already talked about this. What's your typical licensing? It depends. I uh, that so so we don't throw numbers up. That because that's because every different technology <coughs> has a different commercial application and a different commercial outcome. Uh, before we give numbers out, we first want to hear from the other entity. Give me your commercial plan. If you take this technology, what are you going to do with it? Right. So if you give me a technology that says that I know my technology is going to make $300 billion in, in two years, I know to charge you a little bit more money. But if you're going to use a technology that's going to be used for a very niche opportunity, very small, and it's not going to bring in a huge amount of money, I will not give you huge royalties. I will not provide very big licenses. Right. Uh, but every license has a license initiation fee. It comes with payment of patent costs or a proportional payment of patent costs, depending on the field that you would be interested in. Um, so let's say that there's three companies interested in this technology, but in different fields. Like one of them likes the field of food, one of them likes the, and, and the same technology is applicable in um, nuclear production of food. I'm just making things up, right? Um, these are different fields that we can give, but every one of them has some payments of patent fees, um, a little bit of maintenance fees, and then when you make money, then we will make money. Um, that's, that's in royalties. Uh, 
seems seems backwards to me. It seems like if you could if you if you're gonna get a company that can produce more, you take less equity because it's gonna be more valuable in the future. It seems like you're equity you're, or you're, royalty. That those are two different Yeah, things. I understand it. Um, even royalties, uh, you know, if, if it sells more. I'm sure like so so that, that, that's a very good question. Actually, that depends on, so that company, any company, is not going to get to that bazillion dollar sale in one year, mm -hmm. right? So we can structure a, for example, a um, structure. So if you make between 1 million and 1 billion, we will charge you, let's say, 4% royalty, I'm just making things up, 4%. But if you make between 1 billion and 2 billion, then we'll drop it down, right? And then if you make beyond that, then we will uh, drop it down even further, as far as royalties are concerned. I would just, it seems like you're de-incentivizing large gains there. Like if you're making a percentage, if whether it's 3% of 2 billion versus 5 billion, you still make more than 5 billion. It's, 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 it's just yeah. a lot. But at the end of the day, it's the negotiations between the companies and what they're interested in. If it's usually big drug companies don't even care, they say, okay, we'll just give you 4% no matter what happens. We like that one. Yes. Do we, do we also patent out like, publicly, public, like, publicly funded research leads to a patent? Well, we saw this agreement where the company keeps 96%. That's our mandate. So we, we get most of our money from government. And one of the things that government always has, that's as part of the Baidu um, um, uh, agreement with, with, with the government. So in return, so whatever inventions we make under government funding, we have two jobs. Number one is we give a non-exclusive license to that same invention back to the government. So they can do with it whatever they want for government purposes. But then our mandate is to then go out and multiply, basically give it, give it the best possible chance on the face of this earth, right? So that could be in the form of non-exclusive licenses, and it can be in the form of exclusive licenses. I like to do it in different fields, especially, for example, if it's engineering or if it is physical sciences, but if it's biological sciences, yeah, actually even biological sciences, we do it in fields. But what we ask for and demand from our uh, licensees is a great diligence plan that we hold their feet to. So if there, are, if any company is picking up this technology just to sit on it or put it on the shelf because they have a competing technology they want to play with and they want to kill ours, we will take it back. Every license of ours has that. We will take it back. Very okay. Do you have? Additional slides. Just okay. one, okay. I have just a couple more. This one is um, is, a, is going back to industry sponsored research. When we think about licensing and what what type of rights we want to offer a potential sponsor, we advise to limit the scope of work to basically what you're doing. We, we often see these really broad scopes of work, um, and in the agreements, we're offering license rights based on that scope of work. So if the scope of work is super broad then the scope of the license rights that we're going to offer to that company on an exclusive basis are also super broad, which can limit what you do in the future with other companies. So we recommend, and it limits it because we wouldn't be able to offer an exclusive license to another company in that same field of work, in that same scope of work. So we recommend that you limit it to what you're doing um, as much as possible. And then talk to us about what you're anticipating. So are you, are you anticipating patentable inventions? Um, is one of the outcomes software, or are you developing an algorithm? And then we can craft the agreement based on what you're doing and, and what you're anticipating. And then what are your plans? Uh, did you, do you want to do a startup, or do you have a grad student in the lab or postdoc who is interested in spinning out that technology? Because those are really important things for us to know. Oftentimes, even with industry-sponsored research, we have companies that are sponsoring research that are okay with a startup getting a license as well as a company getting a license. So it just depends. Um, some aren't okay with that. And then if you are developing software, are you interested in, in releasing that open source? Um, we have several 
labs uh, and faculty here that have informal agreements that every single piece of software that they create will be released under a BSD. And they've all informally agreed not to enter into research agreements where we are, where we will potentially be required to offer an exclusive license because that's in direct conflict to what they're trying to do. Um, and so those are all interesting things and important things for us to know so that when we're beginning these negotiations with companies, we can be as upfront as possible so that they can go quickly. Um, we did have a case not too long ago uh, of having to terminate a, an agreement because the, the PIs really, although they agreed to the option of an exclusive license, they later decided that they really wanted everything to be open source and the company just wasn't, or more traditional, wasn't okay with the open source unknown. Um, and so both parties decided that they're just gonna not do the, not do the project. So those things are all important for us to know up front. Um, and then we have lots of resources on our website. We're also resources for you. Um, we have an entrepreneurship startup guide. We have uh, some other programs that we're piloting um, that are all on our website that you can look at. Um, we have a monthly newsletter that we can subscribe to, um, and there's some other resources on campus. Um, and then we are here to help you. We are here to serve the campus. Um, and yeah, we're excited to talk to you about any projects you want to do, conventions you have. Thank you. So we have a company that licensed technology from Berkeley. I don't know if they sponsored research initially, but they did take licenses to Berkeley technology. Um, and then continuing to develop those, I think one of them was in clinical trials. And then they, they sponsored an institute here at Berkeley. Um, and so they gave something like seven and a half million dollars over the course of three to five years to fund individual projects. And, um, and then they're interested in licensing back the technology. So that's something that's ongoing right now. Uh, one of the examples of how do we have a higher touch relationship with companies, that's one that we do where we have weekly, so I have weekly phone calls with them to check in on the progress of, of what they're doing. We talk about what our faculty are doing. Um, we talk about where their products are in the development pipeline, what's coming up for our PIs, what's coming up, uh, new projects, potentially new invention disclosures, all of that stuff. So that's one of the high touch things that we can do. And that is definitely a success story. On the engineering side, do you have any? Uh, well, we have, we don't have in nuclear engineering, but yet, uh, but we have had, let's see, Mike handles most of those. So we have had um, Dr. Kozerumi's, uh, Dr. Kozerumi's technology has been in company uh, for a long time and it's going to be well. They also have successful industry affiliate programs that seems to be a new trend. Um, we were talking with Carl Zimmer about this before we came here, where companies are all coming together around a specific topic area. So one, one that is very successful right now is BDD, Berkeley Deep Drive, it's AI um, automated driving. And I forget how many members we have, but they're very active. We have companies calling us up monthly saying, how do, how do we get in there? Um, and all of those companies get non-exclusive licenses to whatever is created. Everyone gets the same thing. And everything that they're doing there is open source. They're pushing out all of their research results uh, out for public benefit as well and out for company benefit. And that's been very, very successful. I think it's a couple of years old. We have a couple other ones that are like that. Uh, the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center is another industry affiliate program that's been around just been like 30, 35 years. And it was originally funded by NSF. I think, I don't know if they, they're still getting any NSF funding, but they have a lot of industry members that have, everyone gets a non-exclusive license, um, any inventions. 
um, and they are inventors in that area. And then there's also an option to negotiate a commercial license. And a lot of those companies come back and sponsor research elsewhere. And they have licensed a lot of those technologies actually out of research. Okay, um, do you have contacts? You can um, go to the website, check it out. If you have any great idea, don't, uh, don't hesitate. It. <laughs> don't hesitate. Don't we do need startups in nuclear field, more of them. So thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank <laughs> you.